A verse in the scripture says, Even if the black mountain were ink, the ocean an ink pot, a branch of the wish-fulfilling tree a pen, the earth a writing leaf, and if using all of these the goddess of learning would write for eternity, the limit of your virtues would not be reached. History has borne witness to great and extraordinary beings. Luminous, all-knowing, poised in perfect wisdom, they go through life in a blaze of light and ecstasy, touching lives and transforming them, compassionate and wise. What is it to be Indian? What is the heritage that defines India? What value does it have in a shrinking, interdependent world? What are the traditional perspectives and achievements that deserve to be assimilated into the common legacy of mankind? Bred to the conviction that they can provide valuable vantage points from which solutions and alternatives to today's problems might emerge. At the turn of the millennium, this most ancient of living civilizations asks this of itself. <laughs> The inherent quest of the Indian mind is a deep reverence for life and a continuous self-awareness of the interconnectedness of all phenomena along with an equal concern for external and internal activity, dynamic action, social justice and peace. There are no artificial barriers created between tradition and modernity, science, technology, the humanities, or the world of ideation, speculative thought and manual labor, the skills of the arts and crafts. The Indian mind grasped that the culture of man, like man himself, cannot but be umbilical to Mother Earth. Men have to live first before they create history and art, and it is Earth's bounties that enables them to survive, grow and multiply. Animals are equally indebted, but cultural growth for man begins when he acknowledges the bounty. It is not merely a belief that we have life here on Earth, but the realization that we have life and health with the Earth. The idea of the same spirit permeating all matter Inorganic and organic, vegetative, animal, human, is at the core of Indian civilization. The concept of cosmic order emerges from this, man and environment interrelationship. Different communities in India, the tribal, rural and at levels of Indian thought and religion, have sanctified the idea of the man-environment relationship. In many parts of our shrinking planet, including in contemporary India itself, people of different faiths often seem in conflict with those that they perceive threaten them. Yet, India is remarkable in its history of accommodation and plurality. The conviction that the highest truth is too profound to allow any one to get an exclusive grasp on it underlines not only the syncretic attitude but also a general spirit of tolerance in the realm of beliefs. Heresy is practically impossible because when no beliefs can be said to be absolutely true, no beliefs can be declared absolutely false. No civilization is permitted, indeed encouraged, as much religious tolerance.
in India, as in other great civilizations and cultures, have flourished and mingled from times immemorial. Elsewhere, the link has been broken, but contemporary India reverberates with the echoes of the past, gives them new shape and form each day. Into its shaping were many influences and interactions with ancient civilizations. Mesopotamia and Babylon, Egypt and Central Asia in the west, China, Japan, Indonesia in the east, Nepal in the north and Sri Lanka in the south. The emphasis lay on seeing the forces of society and nature, not segmentally, but as a vast integrated system, as the order implicit in all creation. This outlook has profound implications. Denial of theism by itself was not heretical. What became heresy was a denial of law, dharma, is its application to society and the moral life of man. The prospects of the complete annihilation of man by man to the power of science and technology in its negative aspect is a global concern. This crisis and the Indian mind's attitude to science and technology included the exploration of the truth for the truth. The great tradition of intellectual and scientific discourse that ever emphasized moral and ethical values. India's achievements in the field of fundamental science have been enormous. A contribution in the area of mathematics, algebra, geometry, its validity in terms of development in new mathematics, quantum physics. Yet each time, it is the viveka of the awareness of man, as capable of deep reflection, which enable the mind to be disciplined, controlled, and to use science and technology for peace rather than violence. There are <coughs> mathematical ideas which tell you that there is no such thing as before. It, it, the, the whole time axis or the clock started ticking from the origin of the universe. So the idea of before, uh, whether in philosophical sense or uh, intellectual sense or perception, uh, it does not make any uh, meaning. You you'd have to say uh, that at t equal to 0, universe came into existence, my clock started ticking and uh, we m start measuring time only from that instant. Now this is a possible way of explaining things, but then you run into trouble uh, problems about how matter came into existence, why whatever we see around it, around us came into existence at that particular moment. And uh, sometimes you throw up your hands and say this is beyond science. The scientific spirit is commonly regarded as the antithesis of India's traditional modality. This is based on outdated notions of science and of rationalism, as unalterably opposed to the irrationality of mysticism and intuition. Only when it is realized that science and intuition are both rooted in the irrational can the real issue of creating a comprehensive order proceed. Indian thought is permeated by the assumption that right perception can only be achieved through synesthesia, cultivation of simultaneous awareness by all the senses, and that in consequence, truth is best attained by sudden revelation. It is commonly believed that scientific discovery 
proceeds by a series of reasoned and orderly steps, by the sequential linearity of logic. This is not always the case. Often the scientist does not advance towards knowledge, but is advanced on, grasped and overwhelmed by it. He shares this kind of possession with the artist's psychological mechanism, resembles that of the oracle's possession, since all three are rooted in unconscious mental processes. The Western concept of history and of all activity is a climactic arrangement that the Indian mind accepts with the greatest reluctance. Conventional segmented linear thought and modes of visualization are quite inadequate to meet the challenges of the non-Euclidean world of advanced mathematics and quantum physics. But the Indian mind is at home among the non-visual velocities and relations of the subatomic and astronomical worlds. It is in these fields, rather than in the applied scientist, that the sciences have attained the greatest distinction. The quality of an individual's life in the contemporary world is fragmented. His psyche is torn, tugged in different directions. He feels rudderless. This is despite development, no matter where in the world, east or west, Japan or America. There is a celebration of life in the Indian landscape in every moment. The sense perceptions refined and chiseled in fairs, festivals, domestic ceremonies, rituals, arts and crafts. The acceptance of this world view is demonstrated through those who work with their hands and those who work with their minds. Those who live in society as dynamic, active members and those in renunciation. There is communion between the old, the middle-aged and the children. The comparative lack of a generation gap. Indian model is the model of Hanuman, or a set of models, modules, not models, modules, that when different cultures and diversities come into India, or have come into India, they have not lost their distinctiveness. They have come into India, stayed with other cultures, retaining their distinctiveness, and interacted with them on a basis of what you might call at one plane a principle of checks and counterchecks. So certain excesses of one group are negated by or balanced by the uh, excesses of the other side on the other side. The Indian artistic traditions had an emphasis on the holistic as their pivot tribal, rural, urban levels, in the oral and in the written traditions. Muslim musicians played in Hindu temples. Aspects of the mind, body and the soul saw a deep communication between them, amongst groups and communities. The content of art is the world of sense perceptions, the pursuit of duty, power, pleasure, all in harmonious balance, always keeping in view that these are multiple forms, but also of the one indivisible unity. In artistic terms, life is divided into a spectrum of the rainbow, comprising different colors and patterns but never oblivious of the white luminosity which is the source to which it must return. There are seven or eight basic moods, rasas, ranging from love, heroism, heroines, the principal modes of music, rags, and the changing seasons of the annual cycles. The 
whole aspiration of the dance, the search for oneself. Like we have certain wonderful expressions in the Vedas like Tattva Masi, you are that. I mean, this is not found anywhere else. And dance is supposedly to connect that inner person with whatever you call it, cosmic consciousness. And I find it does. At that moment of dancing, I never feel I'm I. I really feel that it's the entire cosmos that's within me and that gives me the expression to dance. And once I remember talking to a very great Swamiji, he's not alive anymore, and I said to him, I said, you know, I cannot meditate sitting down. I just can't. And he said, you are lucky. We can't dance. And dance is the greatest form of meditation. In Indian art, the sacred and the profane, the celestial and the terrestrial, the religious and the mundane are differentiated categories, but are always viewed in a relationship of complementarities rather than polarities. Thus, one element can be transmuted into the other, and vice versa. The sensuous can become devotional, the devotional spiritual, and the physical metaphysical. Balance was the goal. The Buddha prescribed the middle path. The Indian mind developed the most sophisticated techniques to train the mind and the body to attain balance. The goal of yoga is the restitution of balance between the body and the mind. The body is not perceived as a snare, but as a potential vehicle for perfection, of a striving for an experience of the zero, the interconnectedness. The idea of yoga is essentially to use and develop the energies and powers experienced at a lower level of existence in such a way that they become the vehicles of crossing over to a higher level. The two underlying assumptions are that the energies experienced at the lower levels are not different from the energies constituting the core of the highest self. It is just that they are received and experienced in a very limited and fragmented way. Secondly, through self-discipline and control, these energies and powers can be self-illuminating, revealing the fullness of ultimate reality beyond the ground of all existence. The yogis had divided the body into five constituents called physical body, physiological body, psychological body, intellectual body and space body. Unless and until we interpenetrate one after the other, the peripheral body first has to be attacked then peripheral body has to be connected to the physiological body, which is the bridge for the mind. So we have to cross over the bridge on the physiological body, from the physical body to mental body. Then using the mental body, we have to understand discriminate each and every part. So after discrimination, penet inner penetrating, then naturally you find that each and every cell in the system has its own intelligence, has its own memory, so that the, the cells can take of the body for me to think of God the higher level of spiritual life. That is what yoga teaches us. The Atman, which is the king of the body, has to flow without any interruptions in the system. As a means of spiritual transformation, all these techniques go beyond merely rational comprehension. They apply all human powers and processes, integrating them into a concerted stream of activity, like a powerful laser that goes straight to its target, taking the self to be the ultimate ground of being, these techniques enable that self to return to its source in the undivided wholeness of ultimate reality. It may be called nirvana, moksha, kevalya or union, but at the bottom it is the bliss and freedom of life lived whole. Detachment, detachment from the body. I am not just the body. So far as a human being is concerned, he can realize himself as a profound spiritual principle embedded in the body. He uses the body as an instrument. But if a man thinks he is only the body, he must be selfish. He must be without any value system. That is, our sages have discovered it ages ago. And so we didn't think of a god sitting in the sky and all that. When you go 4,000 years ago in the Upanishads, you will find this study. 
study of man in depth. That study revealed that behind the body, behind the nervous system, behind the sensory system, behind even the mind, there's a spark of divinity. One infinite divinity in all beings is there because we have come from that and that is there within us also. So a little awareness of that will bring values into human life. That is the great teaching. We don't invoke any devil or some god sitting in the sky, nothing. In this very human being, there are centers from which high values will come. Love, compassion, service, honesty, all this will come when that becomes manifest a little. That is the real contribution of religion, not merely dogmas and creeds and rituals, etc. Actually, religion is defined by Swami Vivekananda in the modern period as the manifestation of the divinity already in man. Because the ultimate level of reality is undivided, Indian gods and goddesses from Vedic times to the present are usually understood to be symbols of the ultimate reality rather than the ultimate reality itself. As symbols, gods and goddesses both participate partially in the higher reality that they symbolize and point beyond themselves to the fullness of that reality. But that a deity is not the ultimate reality does not mean that it is unreal. On the contrary, because the deity as symbol participates in the deeper levels of reality, its reality is greater than that of our ordinary existence. And by identifying with the deity in love and through ritual action, the power of this deeper level of reality becomes available to help effect a spiritual transformation of life. The word holistic is very fashionable nowadays and one often hears people speak of holistic medicine. The word holistic contains the word whole, which is the true meaning of healthy. When there is wholeness of body, mind and self, this wholeness becomes holy. Holy means divine and without divinity you cannot truly speak of holistic practice or of holistic medication or medicine. When a person connects the soul to the skin and the skin to the soul, when there is a tremendous communion between the cells of the body and the cells of the soul, then that is holistic or integrated practice because the whole of the human system has been integrated into a single unit in which mind, body, intelligence, consciousness and soul come together. Happiness needs to be redefined as uh, uh, that security of knowing that your life has meaning and purpose, a sense of connection with the creative power of the universe, the capacity to experience joy and spread it to others, the progressive realization of worthy goals. When you look at all of that, then that's where sadhana comes in. Sadhana, I like to believe, is spiritual discipline, but it's more than that. It's worship. It's bhakti yoga. It's, um, it's uh, an obsession with, uh, with the forces and elements that create this universe. Through science, medicine and psychology have all made tremendous advances over many centuries. No one can yet define a frontier between body and mind or between mind and soul. They cannot be separated. They are intermingled, interconnected, united. Where there is mind, there is body. Where there is body, there is soul. Where there is soul, there is mind. Yet our everyday experience is a great separation between these three. When we are engaged in mental activity, we are no longer aware of the body. When we are involved with the body, we lose sight of the soul. What is the next evolution of man? That is spiritual. How moral values, ethical values, feeling oneness, sarve jana sukhino bhavantu is language in Sanskrit. That people all over the world be happy. We always told like this, in the past ages in India. We never thought of one particular group, one particular section here. But humanity as humanity, let them all be happy. Even the animals, we say, let them be happy, let them be happy. That understanding of oneness becomes possible because you realize beyond this limited body, something unlimited in yourself. That is the Atman, that is Atmajnana. We call it Adhyatma Vidya, science of man and the Atman. 
science or spirituality. The zero is at the apex of the pyramid. The many are at the base. The Indian mind saw the interconnectedness of all things, and in their harmony and balance lay order and evolution. Today man experiences the otherness of the other. The Indian solution is a rediscovery of that interconnectedness, its sense of the unity of all life, the sense of solidarity and emotional sympathy with the many levels of nature. The Indian heritage, the Indian mind, offers not only a unique perspective, but also specific techniques as how these integrative insights might be experienced and manifest in ordering society. Yeah, <laughs> yeah,